Through its worldwide resources, EWTN presents a truly global perspective of our Catholic faith. Welcome to the Catholic Sphere. I'm Brian Patrick. This week, we celebrate the feast of Saints Philip and James. These two apostles faithfully follow Jesus. They're responsible for converting many across the world. So today, we discuss modern missionaries and their role in the church. Let's meet our contributors. Jose Miguel and Carnico is an expert in China-Vatican relations, joining us from Macau, China. Father Tio Charnak is Minister Provincial of the Franciscan Province of Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. He's joining us from Poland. James Day is back with us from Southern California. James is Operations Manager at EWTN Orange County. All right, Jose, tell us how Catholicism first came to that island of Macau and subsequently to China. Hello, Brian. Uh, here in Macau now it's morning. Uh, I hope you are okay. And to our, our viewers, I can say that the, the Portuguese uh, navigators, uh, they were sailing in this area when they arrived in Macau in the middle of 16th century. Uh, they start to trade uh, from this uh, point of China, and because they helped the Chinese to fight the uh, piracy, the Mandarin, who was ruling Macau on that time, uh, he gave um, permission to, for the Portuguese to establish here uh, a trade, uh, like a trade company. And after that, because the Portuguese were, were well, very well being uh, received here, welcome here, uh, they uh, gave the, the permission for the Portuguese to rule uh, Macau. Uh, so, and after that, because the Portuguese, uh, now then the Portuguese established a government here, uh, like a colony. Um, it was a special colony because uh, the Portuguese ruled Macau, but they, they have they still have to pay some taxes to the to the Mandarin and to the emperor in 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 in, in China. So this is part of China, but it's a separate republic, I assume. Would you compare it to say Hong Kong? Yeah, this is like Hong Kong. Uh, Macau is is. Uh, like Hong Kong, is also a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. Uh, it has a huge autonomy in all areas of governance, uh, less uh, in, in two uh, areas, uh, foreign affairs and, 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 and uh, security. Jose Miguel, we're going to get back to you shortly, but I want to introduce Father Tio first. And Father, you lead about 300 friars there in Poland and abroad. Before you took on that role, weren't you a missionary yourself? Yes, uh, thank you for asking me. I, I was blessed by God really uh, with seven years of beautiful experience in Africa, in Uganda. And it was project started in 1983 by Minister General, in fact, American, John Vaughan who asked brothers all over the world to come to East Africa saying, this is the place where we are not present. And uh, that was international community. And up to now, it's really a lively place where we have many vocations. Well, I don't know about other Catholic families, but in our large Catholic family, we were encouraged to become missionaries at some point in our lives. Maybe we have in one way or the other, but you've done this direct mission work. And I wonder what about this work affects you, stands out to you the most? You know, when you go to the missions, you have your own dreams. As a young person, young priest, young friar, you think, now I'm going to preach, I'm going to baptize. In fact, uh, once I baptized 137 children in one mass, <laughs> which is interesting. But uh, in real life, when you are there, it is the mission which converts you, in fact. After some years of my experience, I feel that I was changed and I was converted, not I was the one who converted people. Perhaps that's what Jesus had in mind when he gave us that great commission to make disciples of all nations. 
So when you say you were converted, Father, what do you mean by that? You see, I experienced very deep and strong faith. I can give you one small example which I was touched by very much. Uh, there was a small, we call it outreach, outstation, like 30 miles from the main mission where we were working with the Tutsi tribe. And one week before I went for mass there, I received a message from Poland that a friend of mine was pregnant and the child was diagnosed with very bad sickness, like um, a genetic one. And I shared with the Christians there at the church, you know, in Europe, you can check the mother's womb inside how the child is doing, and the child of my friend is really sick. And one old, old lady during mass, during the prayer of faithful, she prayed like maybe seven or eight minutes, and all church was quiet and listening and praying with her. Okay, six, seven months later, I got message that the child was born and is perfectly uh, healthy. I'm not sure if it's a miracle. I hope it is. It certainly sounds like answered prayers. James, you're on the West Coast where Spanish missionaries founded that chain of missions up and down the coast there. Tell us how that missionary spirit continues today, especially there in the Diocese of Orange where you are. Well, it's interesting because Christ Cathedral actually evokes the medieval approach to missionary work. And what I mean by that is instead of going out to the people, which we do, which the diocese does, of course, there's plenty of ministries that do that, but because of, but the cathedral draws people in. And when you drive through France, when you drive through old Europe, what's the dominant structure out there? It's, it's the cathedral. So it's an invitation to come onto a campus, come into the house of God, and experience God that way. So it kind of uh, you know usurps the, the missionary approach that we think of. But at the same time, as you mentioned, uh, Catholic California is rooted, really the whole state of California, is rooted in the Spanish missionaries that came and, and planted Catholicism here. Well, certainly that is an awe-inspiring structure, Christ Cathedral, but it's also the grounds there. I would imagine that when you invite people into those grounds, there's a peace, there's a, there's a real beauty about that. Does that have an impact on them? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's part of the idea. It's 34 acres. You have a, a grade school on the campus. Mm -hmm. In addition to the worship of the, of the cathedral itself, our offices, our studio is here, Father Spitzer's here, there's a community outreach house where folks come each Thursday to pick up groceries, bus tickets. Uh, missionary work that's practical and that sends people back out into that secular world, that's just so, so tough. And that is one of the most diverse parishes I've ever been to. I've been to Mass there at the Cathedral a number of times. We'll talk more about that diversity on the Catholic sphere. Also, the lives of Saints Philip and James. We read a lot about them in Acts of the Apostles during this Easter season. We would invite you to stay with us on EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Welcome back to the Catholic Sphere, EWTN's weekly global perspective of our Catholic faith. I'm Brian Patrick, joined by Father Tio Czarnak from Poland, Jose Miguel 
And Carnico in Macau and James Day joining us from our EWTN studios in Southern California. James, the first reading during the Easter season is usually taken from Acts of the Apostles. And we learn a lot about Philip and James from St. Luke and Acts. What strikes you about some of the passages that you've read? Well, I would encourage uh, viewers to review chapter eight of the Acts of the Apostles because it really fleshes out Philip uh, who we met in the Gospels, we, it really fleshes, out, fleshes him out here. And in doing so, it, it shows him as a missionary disciple. Uh, it should, talks about him uh, with missionary work about Samaria and a lovely passage that I love where he converts a, an Ethiopian eunuch in the Holy Land. And so I encourage folks to read that because he's so filled with the Spirit that he wants to be baptized right then and there, which Philip does, so it's really exciting. Um, and I think it just inspires us as we uh, think about missionary work that it can be very exciting and, and who knows what can happen with it. So, you know, I wanted to ask uh, Jose, um, you know, with your work over there uh, at Macau, uh, how do you approach that? How does that work in, in terms of the, the oppressive regime of China? Uh, as I was told, after, after the Portuguese started to rule in Macau, the first missionaries to that came to Macau uh, was not Portuguese, were not Portuguese missionaries, were Italian missionaries. Uh, Matteo Ricci was the first one who arrived here. And, and since that time, the Portuguese and, and other foreign uh, uh, people, they, 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 they start to, to work in, in, in Macau, uh, mainly to, uh, to, to go to the governance of Macau and also for missionary work. And um, we we always we always had to to work with uh, different worlds. Uh, the Chinese that were in Macau uh, since and they are in Macau since that time. Uh, the 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 Chinese that were in in mid, in middle of China the, in the central government of that time, and also with with Goa with India. Because the the church in Macau was under the Indian um, rule, uh, Indian diocese, right. you, Goa or Goa diocese, more specifically. So we always uh, learn to work with different people from different world worlds and different countries. And nowadays here in Macau, we have. Uh, we are a special administrative region, but we are also a special religion um, uh, region because um, the Macau uh, bishop and also the Hong Kong bishop, um, the Hong Kong bishop who usually is nominated cardinal after some years, uh, they uh, are nominated directly by the Holy See. Uh, this is a this is something different that if you compare with mainland China, because in mainland China they are nominated by the central government with the agreement of nowadays with the agreement of the OEC. Yeah, and that agreement has since been renewed for a couple of years. But I, I want to get Father Tio in on this. Having been a missionary for so long in Uganda, Father, is there any particular scripture, story, passage that inspired you to go on, especially when things got really tough? In fact, I have to admit that uh, I fell in love with one man in the Bible, which is called St. Paul. His zeal and his travels and his love to God and this, this push to go to the people, it was strong inspiration for me uh, to try to be like him, you know, out of love of God to go around and be able to, uh, to preach gospel. Uh, but what is interesting, what the mission does to you, we all say we believe in God, of course, that's true. Uh, but when you go to the missions, uh, you lose everything. You lose really everything. You are stripped from your comfort zone, from your safety, from your culture, from your food. Then when you feel like alone, you have to lean on God. That's amazing experience of faith. That's why I was saying that, in fact, the missions converted me. <laughs> and deepen my faith. Well, we really do believe in divine providence, especially when you're in a situation like that. 
Jose Miguel, back to you then. You were talking about the, the, the way the bishops are appointed on the mainland versus on Macau and in Hong Kong. But you also are involved with aid to the church in need there. I wonder if you can tell us what is uh, that group is doing uh, to work with the people of Macau and China as well. Actually, uh, the ACN um, is not working in Macau. Uh, they are in mainland China, um, and I'm only the the one that uh, are doing producing some contents for uh, the ACN Portuguese delegation in Portugal because they produce a, a TV uh, program. Uh, with it is a news, a brief uh, news uh, program with, with some interviews and, 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 and some contents like that. And I just, I just prepare uh, some, some content, some articles, some, some, some things. To, I give them some information about what's going on in Macau, Hong Kong, mainland China, and, and all, all this uh, Asian Pacific area. Uh, is my, my work here is only only that. I'm, I'm their correspondent here in Macau. For, it's very for important that, that we have good information because we get a lot of conflicting information from that part of the world. Uh, James, if you would just share a little bit about uh, St. James, since that is your namesake. I know that I think they call this James the Lesser. Right. Right. And I have to say, uh, my name is uh, named after St. James the Greater. Of okay. course, we knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Whose feast day is actually July 25th. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to quickly mention that uh, for Francis Xavier, who was a missionary to Asia, actually his family castle is right on the pilgrimage, the pilgrim trail of the Way of St. James in northern Spain, in Basque country. To, and what Father Tio was saying, to leave your comfort area and to go into this far region, which is totally unknown, uh, at that time in, in the 16th century is just incredible storytelling and it's incredibly inspiring that we can still take from today. Yeah, the saints inspire all of us, that communion of saints that we can be a part of if we stay close to our faith and close to our Lord. Next on the Catholic Sphere, celebrating major Catholic feasts around the globe. Stay with us here on EWTN. You're watching the Catholic Sphere on EWTN. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. This is our weekly global perspective of the Catholic faith across the globe. James Day joining us from EWTN studios in Southern California. Father Tio Czarnek in Poland and Jose Miguel in Karnakow in Macau. James, our Orange County studio overlooks Christ Cathedral. That cathedral parish, in my opinion, is one of the most ethnically diverse in the United States. Would you agree? I do. I, I do agree. And not only is it uh, is English celebrated here on campus, but so is Vietnamese, Spanish, and Chinese. So, how does that parish draw so many different groups that have? settled there in uh, in Southern California? 
The diocese was originally part of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and in the 1970s, it became the Diocese of Orange and with the specific directive that it would not have siloed parishes, but that it would welcome all sorts of different people from different, from different faiths. So in fact, in addition to those languages I mentioned, there's Korean, Polish, Latin, Arabic, those are also spoken uh, liturgies here in uh, the Diocese of Orange. So it's incredibly diverse. It's a microcosm of uh, the Pacific Rim and what's happening here. And to that, to that extent, actually, it, it welcomes all, a lot of people who are escaping different parts of the world or seeking new ways of life. Well, I really felt a part of the Universal Church attending Mass there at the Cathedral Parish. At the Easter Vigil just a few weeks ago, I wonder, did new catechumens join the church there? Yes, there were about 25 to 30 who entered here at Christ Cathedral, because Christ Cathedral is a parish. Uh, but that was not as many as in the past, simply because of, for obvious reasons, 2020 was totally different. It encouraged, so it was a virtual catechumen, catechizing, I guess, was done, but I, I think it shows the benefit and the need for in-person catechizing. And that brings me to, I wanted to ask Jose there in Macau, were there a lot who were welcomed into the church this Easter season there, uh, Jose? Yes, uh, now during this period, uh, we also have a uh, 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 huge diversity of communities, people from uh, all over the world. We have Portuguese, hmm. uh, Spanish, uh, French people, but mainly we have uh, Filipinos, people from Philippines, and and they are the the I I I, I think uh, they are the the biggest uh, faithful uh, community uh, with a strong feeling, the sense of, of of faith here in Macau. And if you if you go to if you go to to the mass, you will see a huge difference of dynamic. We, when you compare the mass uh, in English, where the Philippine people goes, and the other, the other, the other, the other mass, their mass are also very dynamic. But the, the Filipino mass are mass are incredible. I've heard that. All right, Father Tio, when you were in Uganda, how did you celebrate the Easter Vigil there as a missionary? The liturgy is the same, like all over the world, and that's the beauty of a Catholic church. Where wherever you go, you see familiarity. But of course, there were some differences. For instance, the mass lasted for four hours in total darkness or with the candles. And I remember very, very well this feeling when the Alleluia sounded. The whole church was dancing and jumping, and you could really feel uh, that Jesus is alive. And uh, I, I had this thought, I remember very well, I felt like in a community of first Christians, somewhere in Rome in these catacombs. <laughs> that was an amazing experience. Yeah, at its core, <laughs> our liturgies are the same, the same readings, the same practices, but there is there are cultural gems, as you just pointed out, this, this enthusiasm yeah. that you saw there in Uganda. I understand in, in Poland there, there's a tradition at the seminary where you're located, usually brings a big crowd in. How was the turnout this year with COVID? Yes, uh, we have a big sanctuary of Our Lady and Passion of Christ here in Calvaria. It's about two million pilgrims a year. And for Good Friday, uh, usually comes like 100,000 people. But because of the COVID this year, uh, there was only um, uh, the stations of the cross, which are read at the church. But the loudspeakers were all the way in the woods when the chapels are. And we estimate like 5,000 people came, you know, in separate groups with the families, with young kids, uh, just praying by themselves. And it was interesting and nice to see that in spite of difficulties, in spite of these COVID uh, problems, they, were, they missed something and they came by themselves and they prayed themselves on this way of cross. Beautiful. We only have a few minutes left, but I want to ask each of you, starting with you, Father, about missionaries today. Uh, you know, this, the whole, the, the legacy of the apostles, taking the faith out to the world. How can each of us be part of that, do you think, Father? For sure, we cannot stop 
because the church is uh, very, very dynamic. And I can speak, for instance, about our order, which uh, in Europe and United States is going down in numbers. And uh, sometimes when you reflect on it, you, you, may, you may lose the spirit that, okay, we don't have vocations. But on the other hand, you see the places where you put the seed years back, now they are bringing a lot of vocations. Uh, the biggest number of vocations now, you imagine, we have in Vietnam, which is a communism country, huh. and in Africa, uh, which is a very poor a continent. And 100 years ago, our missionaries went there, and they invested faith, they invested their lives, uh, their work, and now we are harvesting that. Of course, I think every one of us can do in many ways. First of all, praying for the missionaries, uh, even going out as lay people. It's a very, very, call, very big call today to help uh, priests and uh, friars and the monks to go and preach and, and work. I have a beautiful example of a young couple from Italy who spent seven years in Africa and they built a beautiful center for handicapped children. And they are running it by themselves and raising money for themselves. Very nice. And of course, Father, as you pointed out earlier, we better prepare for hardship because that's the nature of missionary work, but it's also one of the joys of being a missionary and going out and taking, uh, making disciples of all nations. We want to thank all of you for watching The Catholic Sphere. I'm sorry, but we are out of time. We want to especially thank Jose Miguel and Karnikal in Macau, China, Father Tio Charniak in Poland, and James Day in California, in Southern California, at our Orange County studios there. I'm Brian Patrick. Until next week, we just invite you to come back and join us next week, and we leave you with a snapshot from our EWTN series, The Church and the Poor, with Father Ho Lung, Missionaries in Jamaica, How Pilgrimages Could Inspire Vocations. People can come to see that you, you don't have to have things to be happy. You don't have to have a lot of money to be happy. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, a real barrier in, for vocations in the United States, mm -hmm. that I think young people are growing up with this desire to make a lot of money, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and to have a lot of things and to, and that that is the key to happiness. And mm -hmm. so when they have experiences like this, yes. it helps them recognize mm -hmm. that uh, that is not the key to happiness yes. and yes. Uh, that the key to happiness is coming to know and love God really? and, to, and to know and to love our, our neighbor and to be willing to serve generously, yes. sacrificially, our neighbor, and uh, and including starting with our families, mm -hmm, but uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but with uh, especially with the poor as well.